This week on Filthy Hope. And the big boss comes in and he hands me this flyer and he, he goes, hey, um, Taylor, this building here that you're, that you're fixing up a little bit, we're actually starting a church and um, I'd love to invite you to the, fir- the first church service. Oh. And I just remember thinking, piss off, like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to come to your dumb church. Like, I, I, I still got all of that religion, all that Catholic school stuff. And like, if I could pause and just say, I really now love so much that's come from the Catholic Church. Like, seriously, I, I think we could learn a heck of a lot from them. When you're, you know, I was 17 at the time and like Catholic Church is not cool then. And so anyway, I just had all this religious stuff and I'm like, I don't want to go to your dumb church, but I'm thinking two things, right? You're my boss, so like you can fire me. <laughs> Se- <laughs> you're right, like yeah, I've got to keep in the good books with you. Secondly, your daughter is so damn hot and I'm sure she's going to be there. <laughs> so... <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Filthy Hope. If it's your first time here, welcome. My name is Pastor Jonty, and on this podcast, we spend time in the gray spaces where Jesus, life, and culture intersect. And joining me, as always, is Rev Ness. Hey, Jonty. How are you? I'm good. I'm pumped about this because we've heard episode one. Yeah. And now here we go with episode two. That's right. So if you haven't listened to part one of this conversation with, I should say, it's in the title, but if you haven't seen that, mm. Pastor Taylor Ford from mm. Vic Taz. Um, talking to us about his life as a drifter. Um, Check out the doco if you want to see him in action. Um, But yeah, I do recommend if you haven't already listened to last week's episode, Mm. go back and check that one out first. Mm. Um, If you've already done that, uh, strap in. We're going to jump over to part two of that conversation right now. There was a time period though. So this is where like the faith stuff comes in. So here I am, you know, I've missed the first part of school. I'm, I'm in year 10 now. I fell into a fire already with so much anxiety and, um, you know, self-doubt and, you know, all the stuff that comes with that, just not knowing who I was and not, not fitting in. And I'm going back to school now. I went to a big Catholic school, a big fancy Catholic school. I'm going back now wearing a mask, wearing a glove, and I'm, I'm now the guy that got drunk and fell into the fire. Yep. Like I, the insecurities have gone through the roof mm. and I, I, you know, um, I remember one day I, and I, so I'm just basically the end of year 10, I'm just getting in fights all the time because people were assholes. People were so mean to me uh, mm. and not really to my face, but mostly behind my back. Mm. I remember one time I got in a fight on a minibus with a TAFE student that was way older than me. I tell you, fighting on a minibus is not easy. I don't condone it, but it's not the best space to try to swing arms. I was going to say, not much room for the swing. (laughs) Not much room for that, my man. And so I just was like, I was just broken. You know, I I already didn't feel comfortable being me and now I've got this thing. You know, I'm the the scar guy. Mm. And if I was just to pause and just rewind a little bit, I know we're – out of sync a little bit in the timeline, but it went to court um, and uh, it, it ended up settling out outside of court because there was no law broken. And uh, and so my, my friend's dad didn't get in any trouble, like mm-hmm. at all. And, um, you know, it's been a process for, for my parents more so than me. Um, you know, I think they still really struggle with that. Mm-hmm. But as I started to discover faith and I started to find how, you know, I am, I'm a sinner and I am unworthy but I, am, I will take the forgiveness and I started to learn that I, I really felt like God helped release forgiveness towards um, my friend's dad. And at the end of the day, and I, I understand this now more as an adult, he, he didn't force it down my throat. Like he didn't stand there and tip it in. Like it was still a choice that I made 
it was still something that I wanted to do. I, I could have said no. Um, on the flip side of that, I was 16. I was underage. There should have been a duty of care and he should have told my parents and we should have been supervised. But I still need to take responsibility for it because I still, at the end of the day, I chose to do it, and I and and ultimately I paid the I paid the consequences of that. But I just I don't know without being too super spiritual. Although I am a spiritual guy, so I'm not going to apologise for that. I, I I have fully forgiven him. I would love to have a conversation <laughs> with him. I would absolutely love to tell him I've forgiven him. But anyway, I'm back at school. I hate it. I'm getting in fights, and I'm just thinking I got to get out of school. Year ten. I'm not. There's no way I'm doing year 11 and 12. Get me out of here. I finished as soon as I could and I, I all I knew is that I want to do something in my hands. You know, I'm a pretty practical guy. So I started applying for building apprenticeships. I got one interview, no good. Um, and so I did a TAFE course, which was a pre voc course. Uh, I basically knocked off the first year of my apprenticeship and that was probably the first time in my life where I, where I realised that if I applied myself, I could actually do pretty well. And, I, and, you know, I say that with a little bit of pride. I was like, yeah, maybe I'm not as dumb as I thought I was. Maybe mm. it was just that I needed to actually like what I was learning. Mm. And, uh, and so my TAFE teachers, so what happens in the building industry often is builders will go to the TAFE and they'll say, who are your good students? And so I was lucky enough to get my name put forward to, to this, um, this company, small company, um, they had like a, the boss that did some investment property stuff and they had, they had their own company that, that did transport and so they had buildings that needed fixing and stuff all the time, big families, so someone was always building a house or renovating or whatever and so they had two builders that basically worked for them full time and these builders needed an apprentice um, but they didn't really feel ready to put on an apprentice so the big boss, I actually was employed through him, not for the builders, I just worked with them. And I went and did the interview and I was shitting myself. I'm like this little scarred up kid thinking, how the heck am I going to get this job? And anyway, I, I get the job and um, I start working. And, you know, I talked about Jesus a lot in my life, I realized, but it was never for the right reasons. It was a very common practice in my family to, to use the Lord's name in vain all the time. Like mm. I mean all the time. Now when I look back, I'm like, that's so gross, but it was like, everything and I remember one day um, my bosses who I didn't know but they were like devout Christians like these guys loved the Lord very religious um, but loved the Lord nonetheless and they were like they pulled me aside now like so Taylor um, we need to talk to you about this because uh, we we're Christians and that's like quite offensive to us and I remember saying to them no no I'm a Christian because I've been to, <laughs> I've been to, I was at a Catholic school it's like same same isn't it like I'm, matchy I'm, matchy I'm pretty much there and and, and so I, as my apprenticeship went on over these first you know few weeks months they would just talk to me about Jesus they would tell me about the gospel and and that like my one of my bosses he's like honestly one of the smartest dudes I know he's a pilot now um he's like he was way too smart to be a builder and so any <laughs> theological question I had he would have an answer he'd know the bible verses and and I was just really spiritually intrigued at this time in my life anyway to to cut a short story long um my big boss, the guy that was paying me, he we were building some units and uh, they were living in one of the units and they had a young family and every day um, his kids would go to school and he, they had three boys and one girl. And uh, I remember seeing the girl walk past and I was like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said to I said to my building bosses, I was like, "Who's that girl that walks past every day?" And I remember him saying to me, like really sternly, "Taylor, that is all of our boss's daughter." <laughs> off limits. <laughs> off off limits, Taylor. And so, of course. Of course, I worked out what time she went to school and what time she finished school. And I, oh, I was 
just thirsty at that time of the day every day. And my car <laughs> happened to be parked right near where they walk. And uh, and so I ha- I had the hots for my boss's daughter. And um, one day we were we were doing some a job for them in in this old building that they bought. I didn't know what the building was for, but we were f- just fixing up a few bits and pieces. And the big boss comes in, and he hands me this flyer, and he he goes, "Hey, um, Taylor, this building here that you're that you're fixing up a little bit, we're actually starting a church, and um." I'd love to invite you to the fir- the first church service, oh. and I just remember thinking, "Piss off!" Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to come to your dumb church. Like, I, I, I still got all of this, that religion, all that Catholic school stuff. And like, if I could pause and just say, I really now love so much that's come from the catholic church like seriously i i think we could learn a heck of a lot from them when you're you know i was 17 at the time and like catholic church is not cool then and so anyway i just had all this religious stuff and i'm like i don't want to go to dumb church but i'm thinking two things right you're my boss, so like you can fire me. <laughs> Se- <laughs> you're right, like yeah, I've got to keep in the good books with you. Secondly, your daughter is so damn hot, and I'm sure she's going to be there. <laughs> so, so I, I convinced my younger brother. I'm like Joel. His name's Joel. I'm like we we've got to go to this church, mate. Like you've got no options. I'm not going by myself. We're going to this church, and. Uh, and we rock up on a Sunday and it was not like what I'd experienced in a Catholic school. You know, they had tables, no pews, they had a band, you know, drummer, guitarist. And, um, you know, they they were doing wild like they, they did communion, but they were using like little cups with Coke and barbecue shapes. I'm like, oh, wow. What? I'm like, what is this? And, <laughs> and I, I remember, and this is so funny. I hope, I hope it's funny to you guys. I don't think it will offend you, but. I remember they were doing praise and worship or they were doing worship and there was a few people and they were standing up and they had their hands up and I remember looking at the roof thinking, what's up there? What what are they pointing at? Like (laughs) why the freak do you have your hands up, you weirdos? (laughs) And and I I spoke at a camp just last week um, at, at a Christian school and I said to them, I didn't have like a, big moment where I encountered the Holy Spirit and I fell to my knees and I repented of all my sins and I was but I also at the same time experienced a community like I'd never experienced before and I went back the next week and the next week and the next week and the next week and um and so I, I just started hanging around and then eventually my my boss invited me over for dinner one night and I got to meet his his wife who was doing the church plant with him and um, and they were talking to me all about faith and Jesus and salvation and all these things. And and I'm, I'm just really spiritually intrigued and also still have the hots for their daughter. Um, <laughs> but she was never there, which was a real pain in the ass. She'd like go to some other youth ministry or something and they because they were just trying to get me saved and I was like, where's your hot daughter? Yeah. Um, <laughs> And and so I remember one day they invited me to a a youth and young adults event in Launceston, which is about an hour and a half away. It was at the church that our church was planted out of. And um, I was still in bed when she rang me. It would have been like 12 o'clock, you know, answered the phone, grumpy as probably. And, and Louisa, my boss's wife, invited me. And I thought, oh, again, same thing. I don't really want to go the same things, like this is a recurring issue, obviously. You're my boss, your daughter's hot. Anyway, I convinced my brother to come along and we go to this youth this youth ministry thing. And it was actually it was pretty fun. Um, you know, I'd never been to a youth ministry or anything like that before and a young adult thing. And I was like, these people aren't as weird as I thought they were. And they had some Hillsong students um, do a message and, and they did an altar call. And I, I was like... Didn't really care. Didn't feel that phase. But my brother um, responded 
Wow. And, and he was too scared to go up the front by himself because they asked people to come up to the altar. And they said to everyone, because obviously other people responded, they said, if you're too nervous to come up the front by yourself, why don't you bring someone with you? And so I was like, oh, come on, you wuss. Like, so I basically got saved by default. Like I didn't even <laughs> want to go up the front. So maybe you need to pray for me, God. I don't, am I a Christian? I don't know. Like, <laughs> I just wandered up the front and, you know, blurted out a few lines and, and they gave me a paperback Bible and a Hillsong CD. And uh, that was when CDs were a thing. Yep. And um, I went back to work the next week and I started listening to this, this Hillsong album and, and reading my paperback Bible in my lunch break and just, wow. and, and then I have questions from my boss and I'd ask him and he'd tell me. And, oh. and I was still sort of hanging out with John and Louisa at their house. And I remember one night I was there for dinner and they told me about two things. Um, they, they helped explain what a youth ministry was. Like I'd been to that one, but I, it was like a big event thing. So it wasn't quite the same. And they, they told me what the Holy Spirit was, like kind of very different things, right? Yeah. And I just remember super naively, there's lots of naive things in my story. I remember saying to, like just looking at her really seriously and saying, can I have both of them? Oh. <laughs> and, and so we started a youth ministry. You know, this is a church plant oh. in its first year. We started this youth ministry with a few of the kids that young people that were in our in our church, and there was no like Louisa was the leader. I had, I, I, we, and we were all you know um, get we all got a turn at you know sharing or doing whatever it was, and and around that time, um, the church that we were at that event ran a youth camp, and I I was still working at the time it was during the week, so I went up for like the last half of it, and. Um, and the young adults stayed for an extra night and we all had like this sort of um, campfire vibe and they, and they were all sharing their stories and they asked me about my story and this was the first time I'd ever told anyone about, you know, falling into the fire. I had never really talked to anyone about it and like people were just bawling their eyes out. Like they were so moved by what I had said and I was like, I was just telling my story, yeah. And and then like then the you know word got round and people started and I started getting invited to speak at different things and I think Louisa, you know, I wouldn't want to take words out of her mouth, but started to see that you know maybe there was some ministry stuff on my life and that that was where where maybe God was positioning me to be and she started giving me more opportunity to lead and because my boss, my big boss, obviously was love Jesus, wanted to reach a community, they never stopped me from doing any ministry. Like I was doing lunchtime programs. They didn't care. They're like, yeah, you can go do that. I'm getting paid as a builder, but I'm in wow. school doing lunchtime programs. You know, I'm getting invited to speak at things. And they're like, of course you can do that. Um, and so this this ministry keeps building and building. I'm still an apprentice. I finished my apprenticeship uh, four years in or three years in. And, uh, and I just knew, knew, knew that, like, I didn't want to be a builder. Like, I wanted to preach the gospel. I wanted to see people saved. I wanted to see people set free. You know, this is like first love, you know, like yeah. this is just, well, you don't, I mean, I would, have preached, I would have preached so much heresy, but it was with passion and love. Like, <laughs> I would have been just, because I had no, you know, my wife and all these young people in our in our church, yeah, you know, they'd grown up with all these Bible stories. They just knew them off cuff. I knew, yes. I knew nothing. I was like, I had these few little bits that I'd picked up from from school, and so I quit my job like the day I became a qualified builder, and I I um I took on a position as a youth pastor at a church at that same church that I went to the youth ministry and got saved by default. I started running the youth ministry there. And also running our youth ministry in Penguin. So about an hour and a half drive, which I know is not much for you guys in the big city, but that's like a big drive for us, right? That's like a big um, weekend event, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So I I would drive between the two and ran and the two youth ministries for uh, for two years. Um, I did it like that, and I, it was just such a great time of my life. You know, I was oh so, and I, I started hanging out with Danny a lot more. We weren't like. 
at first we were just friends and then we started dating after a while, but there were some pretty strict restrictions around uh, this around is, that. This is your boss's This is my hot, boss's daughter. daughter. So, so we started dating. So I got a little bit further, right? <laughs> and um, and, uh, and so I remember one day saying to my boss in Launceston, I remember saying, look, I'm, um, I'm thinking about asking her to marry me. You know, we're young. Like I was... Well, she was she was only seventeen when I'm thinking about this. Oh, so wow! Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's like, "Well, you might you need to wait a little bit longer until she's at least eighteen. Um, but she said to me, uh, "If you marry her, you're not allowed to work here anymore." And um, and it was so beautiful. The reason is like. I think they liked having me as a youth pastor. You know, we grew um, really rocking youth ministry seed, heaps of community kids getting saved, and it was just awesome. Um, but she wanted me to be home with my my wife, you know, not traveling, but like because I lived in Launceston half of the week. Anyway, fast forward a little bit, I I plucked up the courage to ask John to marry his daughter. He said yes. Um, and so we got engaged, and uh, and so she was. Danielle was eighteen when we got married. I'm three years older than her, so we were we were babies. Like I get, I'm mar- I've been, Whoa! I've I've been really privileged to marry a lot of young people in our church. And I'm like, you're so young. And I'm like, well, that was you, Taylor. Yeah, well. um, so I start. I I fully um, go full time ministry um, in Penguin on the northwest coast. And uh, and that was that was 16 years ago. So I've been in full time youth ministry for about 14 years. I handed over the youth ministry to a guy that's sitting just over there, um, about in in COVID, you know, peak COVID. And uh, and so my role at the church, I'm the, I'm the associate pastor now. But I ha- I don't really like that title. Um, I I'm really the generationals pastor, so I oversee from preschool to, to young adults. And so that's, that's a lot in our church. Our church is very youth focused. So that mm-hmm. is, that's the majority of our ministries. And mm-hmm. so I oversee them and, you know, hot off the press, I just really feel like, like God is um, just calling me back to youth ministry. A lot of my friends are either planning churches or, you know, stepping into senior leadership roles. And there's definitely like, I feel a little bit of pressure to keep up with the Joneses. Um, but I just really feel like God's saying you're not you're not done in youth ministry yet, and mm-hmm. uh, and I never I never became a youth pastor because I wanted to be a senior pastor. It was never my mm-hmm. I never had that No, nah, yeah. it was never that, yeah. and it still isn't. I just got to battle a little bit of that flesh that wants to look cool like everyone else. Um, I know I'm talking a lot, and you guys haven't said much, but. So no, where does the drifting stuff come into that? So, hang on, hang on. Hold it there, brother. Okay. Oh, yes. Hang on. We've got like a million questions. Yeah, go hit me with something. Can you just can you just give me the piece? You flossed over the Danielle mm. um, marriage piece. Sorry. And, and this, I married my childhood sweetheart. And this tribe of kids that you have, you only look young enough to be a kid yourself. What is with... All these children that you have. Yeah, well, I love sex, so <laughs> um, so so there's that. And you and have no TV, clearly, in Tassie. <laughs> that's what everyone says. I'm like, I've got four kids. Like that's like we've had sex four times. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so we got married. Well, like I said, when we were pretty young, and uh, and we, I wanted kids, as I said, like straight away. And Danielle was like, nah. I'm not ready for kids. Um, you got to wait. And her thing was always, we've got to, we've got to travel a bit. We've got to travel a bit. And in hindsight, I'm so glad I listened. Well, I didn't listen to her. I'm so glad she put down the, her foot. Um, but yeah, we have, we have four kids. Um, so Hunter is our eldest child. He's um, five years old. I'll come back, back to him. Ryder is um, three years old. Fox is two years old. And India is our little baby girl. We finally got the girl um, and she's three months old now. So she's still pretty tiny. Um, our house is very vibrant, very <laughs> energetic. Three, three, bo- the three boys are just crazy. Um, Fox, our youngest, is just wild. 
Um, Ness knows a lot of my story, but Hunter, our elder son, uh, from pretty early on, we kind of knew something was was not quite right with him. He was very delayed with all sorts of things, and um, we we battled the system for a long time to try to get some help, try to get some answers, and it was just dead end after dead end after dead end. And uh, it was only um, a little over a year ago he got we finally got diagnosed, which I was always like, you know, this whole time I was faith. I was like, God, you're going to be good. You're going to come through. We're going to get a diagnosis and they're going to be able to fix it. And I was just holding on to that. And so he's got what they call a world delay. So everything in his world is delayed. His speech, mobility, um, you know, toilet training, just e- everything is delayed for Hunter. So, you know, he's only just started walking semi-well in the last you know, 18 months and he's, he's five and, and he's still very what we call wobbly and he gets fatigued really easily and, um, you know, he has a full-time aide at school and stuff like that just to paint a bit of a picture. But he finally got diagnosed with a genetic um, deficiency called GLUT1 deficiency and there's only 2,000 known cases in the world um, of this, then there's more, but these, there's only been. It's very hard to be, get diagnosed with this, and so essentially, his body. Um, so we all eat food, sugar, carbs, whatever, and it gets turned into um, gluten, and that's what fuels us. And you have these little transporters that take it from your blood and put it into your brain. They're called glut one um, transporters, and so he he doesn't have the transporters. His body will produce the gluten, but it won't put it into his brain. So essentially um, for five years he was starved of um, nutrition essentially and that's why he was always tired and, and the developmental um, issues. And so there's no cure for it. Uh, there's very little information about it. The only thing that you can do that helps a little bit is a full-on ketogenic diet so that it swaps his fuel source from gluten to fat. Which is really challenging with a, he was four at the time, four-year-old that's just used to chicken nuggets, pasta, and chips. And now you're saying you can't have any of that, can't have any carbs. And like without, this isn't a health podcast, but um, keto is a very popular diet. Most people, when they do keto, they do what they're really doing is low carb. They're not doing keto. Proper keto is like a ratio of fat to um, to protein and blah blah blah. So he he's on a very very strict diet. It's very restrictive. It's very challenging, and uh, it has been. I mean, Ness Ness knows. She sent me ball my eyes out talking about this. It is. It has been the hardest moment of my life. You know, I I would put that big long ass story that I told about falling in fire way down the run you know watching Mm. my son struggle through this watching my family struggle through this has been a relentless journey and i you know i said before about the dark night of the soul this is this is we are still in the dark night of the soul with this and we are Mm. yeah we're battling with god you know i'm really learning a lot about laments and uh and that like oh god like why sort of sort of stuff Mm. and uh really wrestling with, um, I suppose, what I want to believe and what I'm seeing and then holding on to the faith of, well, this is what the Bible says. This is what you say. When Jesus turned up, people were saved, people were delivered, but people were healed. And yes. uh, and I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing it in my life. I'm praying for people. I'm not seeing it. But you know what? I don't want to give up on believing that it's possible. Yeah. And uh, so really wrestling that out, me and my wife are really wrestling that out of what what does it look like to sit in this pace of believing that God is all-powerful, almighty, that he's healer, all that stuff, and we're not seeing it. Um, and what does healed look like? Yeah, that's right, exactly. You know, healed, yeah. what we think is healed may yeah. not be what God thinks is healed. Yeah, that's right. And that's really that's a really hard pill to swallow yeah because as a father i'll tell you my definition of him oh yeah walking running talking yeah. girlfriend wife dad job all that stuff driving yes. that's that's what i want but yeah. i've got to come to the space you know i preached about this at church 
cry my eyes. I cry a lot. And yeah, I was like, God, you, you actually owe me nothing. Mm. Like you owe me nothing. Mm. And so I just got to give this to you. Yes. And, but I also know you're a good, good father. Mm. And, uh, and your, your desire is to be a good father. Mm. And just, you know, walking that line between faithful, mm. believing for healing, and then also just grateful for being a dad. And, you know, Hunter's, uh, he's the, the, the saving grace with Hunter is his attitude is just amazing. He's, he's happy. He is, he just brings joy to a room. He, he's so resilient. Like, so with his mobility, he falls over all the time, but mm. he'll just get up and he'll keep going. His teachers, mm tell us that they wish they could have 20 of Hunters because he just wants to try everything. Yeah. Nothing's a problem. Like he's a great kid and, you know, Mm. it's just been a wild, wild journey for us as a family. Mm. Um, And then so on the flip side, Ryder, the second, our second child, he is incredibly advanced. Right. He he was walking, I think, at, ah, I'll probably get this wrong. I'm pretty sure nine months mm. like super early might have even been earlier you know he'll, he'll count to 20 he's like he's doing he's like dad there's three lights there and there's two lights there and that's five and like i've, I've taught him none of that yes. and that was when he was like two like so yeah. he's just which as a parent is really weird mm. because i want to be like yeah you, that's my boy you're so smart but then i feel like when i'm saying that to him i'm actually saying hunter you're done. Mm. Oh. And, and I don't think that. So, you know, it's just, it's just an interesting space for us as a family. Yeah. Do you think in, yeah, and thank you so much for sharing all of that. It's amazing, <laughs> the, mm. the vulnerability and the, and the honesty. Do, do you think that your experience as a 16-year-old mm. has shaped your understanding of God in the way that that relates to your current situation with with your family and particularly with hunter yeah probably i think a lot of it would be subconscious um Mm. and just quite natural i suppose uh but for sure you know life everyone everyone's got a story you know everyone's Mm. got this roller coaster journey and i think we all get to a space in our life where we've got to really choose in in the church world christian world for sure when we've got to choose like are we going to believe this stuff when it's really hard or are we just only going to walk through it when when it's easy? And I can speak from personal experience, as, as I'm sure you guys can. Like it was really easy when I was running both youth ministries, didn't have many responsibilities. Like God is good. Like look at all the growth we've got and now I'm living the dream. And, and it's when, it, when it's your kids especially. Yes. You know, I, I said to Ness, at our, we had a retreat a couple of weeks ago. Like, I've got a, I've got a bloody good life. You know, I live in a nice house. I drive a nice car. I travel the world. I drift in Japan. I drift here. Like, people would look at my. I've got a hot wife. You know, <laughs> all the, uh, all that stuff. Like, people would probably look at me and go, "Wow, he, his life's pretty. I just not perfect. It's pretty good." I, I, and I say this not to like put a pin on my. I'll give it all up. I would live in a caravan. I would I would drive I would walk to work I'd I'd drive a piece of shit like if I could have Hunter if I could see him healed I would give it all up mm. in a moment and mm. so that's just that like, that real wrestle of God you're good look at my life there's so much goodness but I'm not satisfied. I I wonder if it's to do with the fact that when I hear your story. And the thing that resonates so deeply with me is the awe and wonder that happened at the night at the fire mm. when your mates, your 15 or 16 year old boys yeah. Yeah. dropped to their knees wild. and prayed. That to me is miracle number one, Taylor. Uh-huh. Yeah. You, I think the fact that you A, lived to mm. see this, the fact that as shit faced as you were, they got care to you quickly yeah and i think god has sustained you and sustained your life yeah pain free for a chunk of that to get you to the place where they could help manage your pain yeah i i think there is so many miracles in that story that you are a walking testament to the awe and wonder and the miracle nature of our risen Mm. christ and the whole the power of the holy spirit and the power that a bunch of 
little teenage boys can do in just dropping to their knees. Yeah. Just intrinsically knowing that this is what we now need to do. Who yeah. does that shit? I know. <laughs> right? I know. It was I, so I, alien. Some of the um, hardcore Christians that I, don't, I, that I know that I hang around with don't even do that. Yeah. I and still, these... I probably don't do it now. Right. <laughs> so so here's my here's my sermon, brother. Yeah. Come on, preach it. <laughs> so, brother, I'm thinking <laughs> we need to follow in the footsteps of the mates yeah. and drop to our knees and ask yeah. for whatever it is you need to ask for, and in His name, um, God will do the rest. Yeah, I yeah, believe I, that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was almost a prophetic act. Oh, all the way back then. Of, yes. uh, we're surrendering to you. You got yes. to you got to work this out because we can't. Yeah. Mm. I want to swear now, but I, is that appropriate? Yeah, you can say what you want. You yeah, sure? Of course you can. Yeah. Is it going to be offensive to anybody that you have listened? <laughs> I'm so no, nervous no. about swearing now. Well, um, I've told everyone that you're like I, they know you. I'm like I talk you up big time. <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, now I've forgotten how I wanted to say it because oh. I'm so busy getting <laughs> bloody permission. <laughs> Ask for it's, forgiveness, not permission. That's but what it's, we... it's kind of a case of those kids. I can imagine them going, we are totally fucked right now. Mm-hmm. And they drop to their knees in, yeah. their, in that total desperation of That's right. complete fuckedness yeah. and call on the name of God. Yeah, yeah. It's, they had to be at rock bottom of desperation. To yeah. reach out to God, yeah. So I, I, I think that to me says, do we? We don't have to be at rock bottom. We don't have to be at desperation to call out to God. Why, as Christians, do we not just drop to our knees mm-hmm. and cry out? Yep. To our yeah. Father, who I, I couldn't agree more. Right. And why do we have to wait until we stuff up, until we fall in the fire, or until we're divorced, or until we've hit bankruptcy, or we've blah 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 blah? Like that's what I try to say to our young people all the time. You can live your life and screw some stuff up or alternatively you can learn from a lot of these other people and not walk the same path but learn all the same lessons. Yes. The grass isn't greener on the other side. And I know some people say, oh, but you just got to experience that for yourself. I call bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. why can't you just trust good people in your life to go, you know mm-hmm. what? They said that this probably won't work well for me. And even though I want to, I'm going to trust that and just walk, walk in faith in that mm. space. Mm. And, I mean, imagine if that, that's why church is so powerful. It's community. Imagine yes. if some of our young people actually did, did that, listened to wise counsel, yes. made good decisions, didn't make them same mistakes that put them back years, sometimes yes. decades, and then you've got, you know, generational trauma. Yes. Like, we, we, this whole like you do you, if it feels good, do it. Um, mm, you've got to experience mm. it for yourself. There's, there's some space for that. Mm. There's some space for that. But when we, we've swung too much into that space where people are just screwing themselves up, mm. some people are just screwing themselves up. Mm. And, uh, and, and I think us older people, and I'll put myself into that category. We, we need to be doing community better where we're helping them learn from our mistakes. Perfect segue mm. into what I wanted to ask you about your next stage of mission. Mm. Yeah. I, it, I love this bit. Yeah. This, is, this really um, float my, floated my boat because when <laughs> we were sharing, you were sharing with me at our, the pastor's retreat that we were a part of together with Andrew. Shout out Andrew Renucci. The Reverend Doctor Andrew Renucci, great leader. The big dog. <laughs> the big dog. Oh! <laughs> He'll um, love that. He, he will. <laughs> he's a weapon of a human. What are we going to call him? This the Italian stallion. Stallion, I think so. He's just a machine. Any church people that are listening, and you want a great uh, leader and facilitator of all things, yeah. he's your man, and we can put yeah. you in touch. We might put his details below in this pod. Yeah. He's, he's an epic human. Yeah, he is. I was going to ask you about the next piece of your story, mm. and I don't want to park the Hunter story because I think that's no. a whole piece that's actually going mm. to continue. God has given you so much material. Yeah. So many stories. It's, oh, I've, 
I please don't be offended when I say this, but I feel like it's there's so many blessings in that. There's oh, ble- I, there, there is, Ness. There's uh, there blessings is. in that. He, he, he is showing people Jesus and he doesn't oh, even yes. know that's what he's doing. Yes, yes. And as the father and the mother of this precious child, God is doing the most incredible work through you guys with him. He's just, mm. he's, your, he's your junior pastor in making, mm. really. He's, he's just incredible and God has amazing things yeah. for Precious Hunter and your family. Amen. I wanted to ask you about the ministry piece though, Mm -hmm. because I was a school chaplain at MLC school in Sydney and it was one of my greatest love stories of ministry and I never wanted to be a school chaplain and then it was my first placement as a Uniting Church minister. So And, oh, man, I just went off. I just loved it. I was probably Mm. half cooked as a reverend at that stage and I was probably incredibly um, not 100% appropriate, but I think the kids really liked They're me. They're the best chaplains. Yeah, because I was just a bit <laughs> exactly. raw yeah. and a little bit authentic and not yeah. very proper. I, I'd had to kind of put on proper. Was, um, it, a pro- was it a proper school? Oh, posho. Oh, yeah. okay. And yeah. shout out to my MLC peeps. They, it is a, a kick-ass Uniting Church school. And yeah, I nice. think the girls would love to hear your story. Yeah, Taylor. I'd love it. And I think the boys at Newington would love to hear your story. And the school where Jonty went at Knox Grammar, those boys would love to hear your story. Mm. I think there's so many, and Pimble Ladies College, the the girls up there would love to hear your story. I I would love to hook you into the Uniting Church um, space where you could come and tell your story because it is powerful. And if you could um, um, save children, through the way that God has shaped and formed you through your story and life experience mm. and the hardships mm. and the, the resilience, et cetera, and, 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 and yeah. your whole hot wife story. I mean, there's mm. so much to your story. I don't kind of know where to go. And yeah. then you're just like this really cool <laughs> bloody drifting rally car dude. Like, man, what is there not to love about <laughs> well, Pastor there's a, Taylor? There's probably a lot. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, Obviously, for the listeners, um, you have no idea about what Ness is alluding to. But if I was to rewind, you know, I sort of touched on a little bit when I, like, when I came to faith. That that sort of moment when I was like, I've wasted seventeen years of my life because I thought I knew what this was, and I avoided faith. I avoided the church. Like, why didn't someone tell me? Why right. didn't someone say I could still do cool stuff? And so. I, I, I can't find it, but I paid one of my friends to design me a logo and we called it at the time um, Drift Ministries. And I just wanted to somehow, I didn't even know how, I wanted somehow to use my car and drifting and the gospel and join them together to help take off some blinkers, to help break some stereotypes. And... This was like this when I was working in Launceston. This was very early on in in ministry, and in hindsight, looking back, I think that God it was a God uh, dream, but I just wasn't ready for it yet. Yeah. And so the doors were sort of open, but it never felt right. I got offered a position to do some sort of evangelistic ministry in this sort of extreme sport um, area, but I really just didn't. I felt super called to still be in Penguin and, and in Tassie. And so I didn't really pursue that. And But it's been something that's sort of been on my mind ever since I started ministry, like right from the beginning. And it was about two years ago um, that I had an opportunity to sort of fire it back up again and, and to work out, okay, if I was going to do this, what would it look like? Um, and now, you know, I've got, I'm not an expert by any means, but I've got, you know, 15 years of ministry experience under my belt, working with young people, presenting the gospel. Um, you know, I would, I don't know how to say this without sounding cocky. Um, I have had it said to me, and I do believe it, that there is an evangelistic gift in my life. And uh, and I really want to be faithful to that. Like I really, I really just, I there's nothing greater than, seeing young people have them blinders taken off, them stereotypes broken and them going, you know what, I think I want to give this Jesus guy a go. Yeah. And, you know, Amen. I think my story of falling into the fire just works 
really well. And, you know, do I think God pushed me to fight? No. Do I think um, it was a part of his ultimate plan for me? No. But do I believe what it says in Romans, that he can turn all things around for the good of those who love him? Heck, yes, I do. Mm-hmm. And I think that this the fire story is a big, it's, it's that that verse beautifully portrayed. You know, he, he turned around, you know, if you want to get really spiritual, the devil trying to kill me yes. into leading people to Jesus. So yes. I had this desire to somehow join like the extreme sports element of, of drifting and ministry together. And so, as I said, opportunity to sort of launch this thing. And, and so I have, I'm, I'm in the process of starting a non-for-profit. We are very close. We are like literally days away from, from having it officially up and running, which by the way, is so bloody hard to get it <laughs> off the ground. I had no idea how much red tape and paperwork there is started on for profit. Anyway, lucky I've got great people around me. Mm-hmm. But we're launching a ministry called Dare to Drift. And uh, the concept of it is uh, I'll be taking, I'll literally take my drift car with me to schools all across the country uh, with my family, hopefully. And, um, and we identified that within Australia, uh, faith-based schools, there is um, almost a million students in faith-based schools, a million teenagers in Australia in faith-based schools that the schools are built on, you know, the gospel is their cornerstone, Jesus is their saviour, like all these things that we preach about that we want to see come to be, but we know statistically at best, at absolute best, 10% 10% of them are active in their local church and they have a faith of their own. I'd now, say it was I, even less than that. Oh, I, yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely less, but let's say at best, and I'm terrible at maths, but I know 10% off nearly a million. We're talking about 900,000 young people that are allowed to have the gospel presented to them, mm. that are in an environment where they believe it, they they want to see it happen, but are, are not reached. Like yes. You tell me, I'm going to get passionate here. You tell me, you tell me where you can find anywhere in Australia that many people that are primed for the picking but have not yet experienced the gospel in a real and transforming way. Mm. I don't reckon you'll find it mm. because we have all these evangelists, and I, I don't do that to discredit them like I'm the best one because I'm definitely not, but we have these evangelists that want to preach the gospel in public schools where there's all these unreached kids, but they're not allowed. They're not allowed to say Jesus. They're not allowed to invite them to youth ministry. They're not allowed to invite them to church. All they can do is share their story. And, yes, I have a powerful story. And, yes, I do speak in public schools. But at the end of the day, all I'm doing is talking about myself. All I'm doing is leading them to Taylor. And I have no desire whatsoever to build a platform for myself. I want my story to point them to Jesus. Yeah. We are unashamedly. Yeah going after the unreached in Christian schools. Yeah, wow. And, uh, and so that's our, that's our mission. That's our mandate, to reach the unreached with mm. extreme sports evangelism. That's what we're calling it, mm. uh, in schools across the country. And, uh, and we know that not everyone cares about drifting. Most people don't. But you know what they do have? They have stereotypes. And when this guy rocks up with his big truck, this big tray, this loud, obnoxious drift car, they look at, <laughs> they look at it and they go, that and Christian, yeah. that doesn't make sense. And so they don't have to like cars, yeah. but it, it breaks down some of the stereotypes mm. straight off the bat. Mm. And then hopefully when we present the gospel and the story, we've already won them over a little bit because mm. it's not what they thought it was going to be. Yeah, it correct. wasn't this polished looking, um, you know, all the stereotypes that they have. You and mean just, the gabardine pants and the check well, shirt? Are you going to wear one of those? Uh, what do you reckon, Ness? <laughs> I don't think so, brother. And, and, and um, you know, it's a bonus if they like cars because then we've definitely got them hook, line, and yeah, sinker. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but we, uh, so, yeah, we've termed it extreme sports evangelism. We just want to reach the unreached in, in, in a space where they are primed for the picking. You know, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Yes. The, the harvest is plentiful. Yes, it 900 is. 900 plus thousand young people. Yeah. They need Jesus. Yes, like they, they do. They are desperate <laughs> for Jesus. And they are in the stage of their life where we know statistically they are way more likely to respond to Jesus, but they haven't had the gospel presented them presented to them in a way where they go, that's attractive. I want that. Mm. And so mm. like as the church, 
why aren't we doing more in these mm. in these spheres? They are so unreached. You know, from all my years of youth experience, mm. I've been in Christian schools. I got some wild stories from Christian schools. They make some public schools look like saints. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. John, like, you went to one of those. Yeah, you, yeah, oh, no, you would have experienced You're talking my language. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yes, we could go to the public schools and because of my story, I know I'd get in. Like drug and alcohol stuff is huge. There's, 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 there's money to be made in that stuff. Mm. But it only leads them to all, all they walk away with is going, wow, he fell in the fire and that was pretty shit. Mm. And like whatever, like. What about the transformative gospel? Yeah, what about your sins story. are forgiven? What about yeah. you are made with a purpose that you're not an accident? That there's things inside yes. of you that need to be let out, and if they're not let out, the world misses out. Mm. Like I just, I, I've got to fire my bones to see young yeah. people saved and set free, and and break out of this stereotype of what they think mm. a Christian is and isn't, and uh, and so I want to drag my drift car around the country, changing some minds. And leading people to Jesus. Amen. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm. Yeah. And there's so much more to it than that. Like, you know, there's discipleship pathways and, and ways that we're going to try to connect them in with local churches and, and mm. all that sort of stuff. We want but to be that... on this journey with you. So please hook us in because we'll yeah. hook you in. 100%. I would yes. so appreciate that. Yeah, I, we I, mean, would... I honestly, Tasmania, I know lots of people. Queensland, I've got a few connections. But yeah, we'll support um, New you. New South Wales. No, nah, just well, the, it's just, the it's the best state, and no. we have we have got lots of kids here at Christian schools that are going to love you. It coincides with a conversation that we've had both on this podcast and off this podcast, like just this year already, about the uh, position that, particularly here in New South Wales, we're in with so many not just church schools, but uniting church schools that we have yeah. immediate access to, and the, yeah. the complete like untapped potential yeah. that that is just the yeah. number of people that um, are, are ready to receive the gospel. And, and it's, it's yeah. staggering when you look into it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really exciting. Yeah. I yeah, had, a, um, I had I, a story that, you know, a little bit about Taylor. Um, so a, a child sexual abuse story as a little girl and, um, and then awful decisions I made through drinking too much alcohol as a young teenage girl. And, I was kind of not allowed to share that at school mm. when I was a chaplain there because it kind of looks like you're not being a proper inverted commas chaplain yeah. if yeah. you've if you're um, sharing your dirty laundry, I suppose. Yeah. Yet yeah. I think that that's such a powerful conduit to to the Lord and what mm. God has then done. And on one occasion where I never vetted my sermon with anybody, I shared at a, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I shared to, I think it was 900 girls yeah, and wow. from year seven to 12. And I shared just no deep detail, but um, about what had happened in my life as a kid. I was told never to talk about it again, but wow. I had so many connections come about from that. With of the girls. And if you think if the stats on child sexual abuse are one in three for girls, yeah. that's, you know, what's a third of 900? Yeah. That's 300 girls sitting right in front of me who are experienced right. um, sexual abuse. Um, and I had a handful of girls reach out to me and I, I it was like instant relationship building yeah. because they knew I was a safe survivor person with pastoral skills to talk to. Yeah. And it was phenomenal. So I think your story is just epic. And I praise God for you, mm. Taylor, because your ministry is just balls to the wall, sensational. I think it's just mm. so unreal. We want to play. Yeah, well, look, I, um, I, I know that it's not, it's not mine and I don't say that again to be whatever. I feel like God is opening doors and that's been the whole way long. I'm just trying to be like this, God, if you want it to happen, yeah. You've got to make it happen because yeah. I've, got a, I've got a family, I've got a church, I've got like, I can keep myself pretty busy, God. Yeah, but if right. you want this to happen, you've got to open the doors. You know, just even meeting you guys and some of our conversations, Ness, I mean, mm. God's hand's just on it and mm. I'm, I'm willing to go as far as he wants to take it. Mm. Can, can I ask you, have you 
the falling in the fire story is just, I think it's a life and death story. I see the miracle nature of how God sustained you from dying so that you can actually share that story and, and link that to the gospel and your salvation and the hot wife and the drifting and how all that comes about. I can so see Christ's thumbprint on you, Taylor. Have you ever come to the point where as horrific as that story is, and it chokes me up, I cry every time you've shared that story. Um, have you come to the point where you've actually thanked the Lord for the experience? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, I, I would answer that by saying when I um, first started going to church and it was like not long after being out of hospital and, well, I mean, it's sort of all blurred into one, but I remember my whole family, my, my parents, my brother, myself, individually all had to go to a psychiatrist. Yeah. And, um, and this is when I'm like sort of discovering faith and learning about Jesus and forgiveness and blah, 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 all that stuff. And um, I, I went to one session and I met with them and I must have shared a little bit about what God was doing in my life yeah. and I never had to go back and every single one of my family members went back. And I don't know what happened, but there was a time in my life where I went from, you've really effed this up, Taylor. Yeah. You're the scar guy. Everyone's going to hate you to I just owned it. Yeah. And I went, God, if this is this is who you've you, – and I, I got, it's, I'm clunky with words because this isn't who you made me to be. Again, he didn't push me in the fire. But this has happened. You've got a plan and you've got a purpose in this. I, I accept this. And I'm not going to be ashamed anymore. I'm not going to be embarrassed. I'm just going to, I'm going to own being tailored, fell into the fire. And um, it was somehow, it was a very spiritually mature, way beyond my years moment where, where I essentially did do exactly what you said. I went, you know, God, thank you. This is, this is me and let's yeah. roll with it. And, yeah. um, and, and, you know, that doesn't mean I haven't had moments when I've been like, oh, this really sucks, God. And to be honest, if I, like, if I was still a bachelor, never found love, I think it would be probably a pretty different story. Mm -hmm. um, but my life's good. It's got some big challenges, but I can just see his hand on me. And, and I, when I talk in schools, I, I usually try to leave room for some questions, always the same questions. Do you still drink? What happened to the dad? Um, and would you change it if you could? Mm. And I always say, I don't really like alcohol that much. I have a few drinks every now and again, but it doesn't even taste that good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just rather like a Coke or chocolate milk. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm still a kid. <laughs> or um, oh, chocolate milk. Yeah, chocolate milk is the best. Um, and the friend's dad, he didn't go to jail and I can talk about forgiveness and blah, blah, blah. And then thirdly, you know, like I actually don't think I'd change it. And and I don't, I know that can make me sound like such a wanker. Not but at all. I, I think God allowed it, if that's the right word, and maybe even that's a bit clunky, to happen to me and my family for multiple reasons. He knew I could handle it. He knew my mother would change the law. He knew that I, there was like this, this ministry stream ahead of me. And so I just think like maybe it wasn't your ultimate plan, God, but it's been a bloody fun ride and mm. um and i i love where i'm at and i'm um, it's hard i cry a lot especially with the hunter stuff but i wouldn't want to do it any other way without you and if this is the way that i got to you then yeah thank you lord jesus amen mm. that yeah level of gratitude is just palpable yeah it's a lot in that isn't there it's so something we we often ask our guests um as we kind of uh move towards the end of uh, of when we record podcasts with guests is, is what are you grateful for? Um, yeah. I guess in, in all of this, yeah. um, I'm sure there are so many things that you, you find gratitude yeah. for, but what, yeah. what are you feeling grateful for today? Yeah. Oh man, that's, that's an, that's a really easy answer. Um, ultimately I'm so grateful for Jesus. I'm so grateful for his forgiveness, the purpose that I feel from him, the community that comes from within a church. Um, but on top of that, uh, my, I was raised in a beautiful family with parents yeah. that loved me, that treasured me, that cared yeah. for me, um, 
And although, you know, the, on that faith journey, they haven't arrived to maybe a space that I would hope and pray, I'm just so grateful for for the environment and the opportunities that I've grown up in. You know, my mum is my biggest champion with this dead of just stuff. Like she couldn't be more proud of me with it. And my dad as well, but my mum especially. And then secondly, um, John and Louisa, my, my in-laws, also my senior pastors, they are just phenomenal. Um, the opportunities they've given me and the, the scope that they've given me to just try and fail and try again is beyond measure. I could never explain my gratitude to them. I wouldn't be the person that I am without all these adults in my life. And, uh, and they gave a young guy a crack. And, mm. um, and I really hope I can, I'm trying to do that with our, the next generation. I really hope mm. I can continue to pass on that same legacy of like stand mm. on our shoulders and go further. So I've just been so blessed to have people in my life that have cheered me on uh, and encouraged me. Mm. And so obviously cheese number one, but the other, that, them other, that other stuff is just money can't buy that. Yeah, a bit of a poser. You've got a bit of a list, you rat bag. <laughs> oh, come on. You're hogging all the good shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, gotta... I, well, I know <laughs> it's like uh, it's it sucks, but it's not everyone's story yeah. and, and it breaks my heart. It, mm. Like I could rattle off a huge list of names of young people that have not had supportive families, mm. not had supportive parents. Yeah, you're right. And That's not right. had that like. And I, I've had that, and then and then on my in law side as well. Like mm. so blessed, so mm. blessed. And obviously, my wife's in there. And she's the best. She just lets me do ministry. She lets me drift. She lets me spend money on cars. She lets me travel. <laughs> um, she's just the best. She's the best mum. She's hot. Um, <laughs> I can't wait to meet her. Yeah, I can't wait for you to meet her too. Hey, can you talk me through your ink? Yeah, um, talk so us I've got through, talk us through some pictures. I got quite a few tattoos now. Like when I got my first tattoo, I didn't really know anyone that had a tattoo, and now obviously everyone has them. So I'm like, ah, oh, they're kind of a bit like everyone's got them now. Anyway, my <laughs> first one's my first one's la- kind of lame. It's probably like that ugliest looking one I have, but it means the most to me. Um, so if you can see, look how lame it is. It's, oh. it's a cross with wings and flame around it. It's yeah. the very first tattoo I ever got. And, uh, and I, like, this was peak on fire for Jesus. And I was like, it was the same as the Dare to Drift stuff. I just want to break stereotypes and tattoo does that in church. Like, yes, which is, it does. Yeah. Like wild that it does. But anyway, so, you know, fl- the flame was falling into the fire, obviously. And then I found Jesus, which was the cross, and it set me free, which is the wings. Mm. So, like, super, it's like a bit. A bit lame, but you know, it just means so, so much not to lame. Me. Yeah, mm. and so you know, I've got John three sixteen under here. I've got. I'm just trying to look at what oh, through the through the mic um, camera. I've got the whole armor of God. So there's a warrior. There's a helmet somewhere. Where's the helmet? Uh, there, there's the helmet. Oh, there's the shield. There's lots of Bible verses. So there's um, Isaiah twenty two which talks about God like having the keys and being the ruler. The dove, which is the Holy Spirit, which is like running through my veins. Uh, it says Yahweh there. Um, um, the anchor with Hebrews six nineteen, which is talking about him being anchored to our soul. Uh, there's a clock there, which is uh, the same time I got married. Oh. And, uh, uh, but it's um, Psalms, which talks about God being the ruler of our time. The dream catcher there, which is Acts, but it's really, I, I probably should have put Joel, but you know, it's a bit weird having someone's name on you. So I did Acts, which is... <laughs> Young men and women will dream dreams and see visions. And then on my leg, I've got a big lion, which which Ness weird, has a weird story about that. Um, I've got an eagle um, uh, uh, with the snake in its talons, killing the snake, but the snake has the apple in its mouth. So it's just mm. a prophetic, um, mm. a prophetic tattoo of like God one, basically. Mm. I've got a, a um, what are these things called? What are they called again? Oh, like an hourglass. hourglass. I've got an yeah. hourglass and it says be wise on it because there's a Bible verse that says mm. be wise with your time. Mm. I've got, um, I need to add on. I've got three arrows. You know, the Bible verse that says um, the man with a, a quiver full of arrows is blessed. So I've got to get another arrow put in there for India. 
Um, there's a few other random ones spread about, but yeah, it's they all have a purpose and a meaning. And they, especially in the early days, they were such a brilliant um, conversation starter with mm, young people. Mm. It's a beautiful, yeah. that's a beautiful thing to um, just to show. It's like artwork all over you yeah. and to explain it because they all have such a beautiful, deep connection with your story and who you are. Yeah. yeah. Oh. You're amazing. It's so delightful to have spent time with you today. There's, I'm sure we could do a whole series on Taylor Forward. <laughs> oh, I, I'm just looking forward to having you back a second time in a year's time when we can talk about all the wonderful things that this new ministry yeah. has done in schools. I, I, my, my mind was just racing uh, with all, all sorts of things that, that we can talk about the next time we do this. Um, yeah, awesome. Are, are, there, are, there, are there places online that people can find you if they want to? Follow up um, on anything so, or touch? Yeah, there, there is. So the dead of the drift stuff is still very much in its infancy. So there's yeah. nothing um, for that yet. We're working on a website and stuff like that, but we need to have the car finished and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, of course. Um, but my, I suppose my online, uh, I don't know, tag is the small town drifter. I live in a small town and I'm a drifter. So I, I play around with YouTube and have a, have a YouTube channel and Instagram and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, the, totally love hearing people's stories and meeting new people. So, And our listeners follow. can go and have a and watch you drifting because I know you've shown me um, live footage of you actually doing it. Yeah. It's really scream-worthy. It's like yeah. Luna Park, Disneyland yeah. on steroids, mate. Yeah. That yeah. shit crazy stuff. Yeah. I, We've we'll got put to links to stuff car. down below. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. We need to. We need to make. When, make when I'm in car. Sydney, I'm going to have my drift car. We're doing a drift event, and you've got to come. Yeah. Oh, I will scream from the sidelines and go mental for you, Taylor. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll see. We'll see. We'll have this conversation in a year when, when we've got footage of you in the car. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> I will shit myself. That's the thing. <laughs> That's why I need to film. Make- they make <laughs> adult diapers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I made for good content. Yeah, thanks, John T. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so good. So we will put um, links for all the, all that stuff down below um, for yeah, people cool. if people want to, um, yeah, hang out with you over there and, and see some more of your stuff. Um, yeah, great. We thank you so much for your time. You've been super generous. Um, we I. I can only speak personally but i'm sure on behalf of ness as well i've loved hearing your story um i just want to really thank you for for being so honest and, and vulnerable with that so thank you oh, yeah. thank you i appreciate what you guys are doing i think it's an awesome story of uh of how it all happened with um filthy hope and i'm just stoked that i get to be a little part of it mm, it's wonderful and we are going to enjoy being on your journey with you too totally yeah, yeah. so thank you so much we'll- no worries and we're back. That was fantastic. Oh, man, he's great, isn't he? He's such a gift and I, I'm super excited to see what happens with yes. that new uh, mission of his. I know. Um, I just can't wait to see it unfold and and hopefully this podcast will give him a leg up into the United Church schools and let's yeah. see where that goes yeah, for him. Yeah, I'm really absolutely. excited to be um, fanning him. Yeah. And if you're, if you're a listener and you in any way mm. feel like you could contribute to that um, – Taylor's contact details are, are all down below um, yes. or even get in touch with us and we'll, we'll um, if you want to just be involved in any of what we talked about, yeah. um, that would be really, really incredible. Incredible um, segue into youth ministry, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Powerful story. Yeah, especially in relation, I think I mentioned this in the episode, to the conversation we had the, with Richard earlier this year mm. about, you know, at, at the Uniting Church has such a deep well of young people yeah. attached to its schools. Yeah. Um, I, I think something like what Taylor is planning – could be really, really exciting. Yeah, really yeah. impact lives. Yeah. Definitely. So next week um, we will be hearing from the Reverend Dr. Andrew Renucci. Oh, my gosh, he's a good dude. He's the best. Yeah. Um, so look forward to that. Um, if you are listening to Into the Word, we'll see you tomorrow. If you don't know what Into the Word is, that is Vanessa and I talking about scripture and unpacking some of that stuff uh, in a more short form uh, podcast links down below if you want to check that out as well you just called um, me vanessa that was really creepy I, as i said that i was That's like why so on earth did I, <laughs> I don't know how that happened or I'm why thinking, that happened who is that and i, I made eye contact with you as <laughs> okay. i said it and i'm like it felt weird in my mouth <laughs> rev ness <laughs> just ness <laughs> yeah. so what 
that was bizarre. Yeah. I don't know how that anyway. happened. Um, yeah, if you want to get in touch and, and make fun of me for calling Ness Vanessa, uh, <laughs> filthyhopepod <laughs> at gmail.com, or you can find <laughs> us on socials. Uh, join our Facebook group, which is down below as well, if you want to come hang out with us uh, in person there. Live events, links for that down below as well, if you want to see us in person and come hang out. So much information. I know, it's a lot. Uh, I think I got all that out. You smashed if it. If I missed any of it, just check down below. It'll be in the video description yeah. of the pod uh, show notes. Um, Drive safely. Yeah. See you next week. Bye. This is a prayer for the people who